So next up is Victoria Baranetsky, who's the general counsel at the Center for Investigative Reporting. When I read her bio, you're going to think she must be like 75 years old, but she's not. <laughs> she, before coming to CIR, she was the first book legal fellow for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a legal counsel at the Wikimedia Foundation, and served as the First Amendment fellow at the New York Times. After graduating from Harvard Law School, she received a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford University and clerked for the Honorable Rosemary Pooler of the Second Circuit. She has a bachelor's degree from Columbia University and a graduate degree from Columbia Journalism School. She's, see, she spent most of those years in school. <laughs> um, she currently is a fellow at the Tao Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. She's also a wonderful human being and one of the best hires I've ever made. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Victoria Baranetsky. I'm a free speech attorney and serve as general counsel at CIR, the oldest nonprofit newsroom in the Bay Area, based here in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm pleased to be here to speak to you about one of the most important things that exists in our society, the legal protection of stories, and explain how they are at risk. As journalists, you all know and value the important stories, but so do attorneys. At the core of every case are the facts of what happened to the plaintiff and the defendant. The holding or the rule is the lesson that results from those set of facts. And the most moving stories are often the ones that shed light on things that otherwise would not be changed. We see this happen with canonical cases like Brown v. Board, Lawrence v. Texas, Roe v. Wade, where the holding completely shifted our thinking of society. As you all will know, in the United States, we have a variety of rights that are protected under the Constitution and Bill of Rights. The first of those rights, enumerated in the First Amendment, states Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It is here in our Constitution where we value our stories by protecting free speech as well as you, the professional storytellers who tell them. Many scholars believe the First Amendment to be of primary importance within our Constitution, not just because it's number one, but because it serves as a check on government. But there's another deeper reason. As Justice Jackson wrote in a 1943 case, West Virginia v. Barnett, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is the right of the First Amendment to protect us from control over our thoughts. At issue in that case was the question of whether a student could protest saluting the American flag during the Second World War. The court wrote that a student could protest because it was principally different way of looking at the world outside of the status quo. That's the core of the First Amendment, to leave room for minority voices that can change things. In our society, journalists are the megaphones for minority voices. But no one said telling these stories makes you popular, as we've heard. In fact, the best stories often cause consternation. For example, even the esteemed Justice Brandeis wrote in a famous 1890 Harvard Law Review article that the press is overstepping in every direction the obvious bounds of propriety and decency. Gossip has become a trade which is pursued with industry as well as effrontery. The fact that the fact is, sometimes there is gossip. But sometimes there are great stories, and new ideas don't come without ruffling a few feathers. That's why nearly half a century later, another Supreme Court Justice, William Brennan, wrote in a landmark 1964 press freedom case, New York Times v. Sullivan, that the press is necessary in part because it provides a world where debate on public issues should be, quote, uninhibited, robust, and wide open. In essence, the news media works when it sparks strong reflection and discourse on issues and stories that matter in society. And if that system of story making is working well, we are living in a society of knowledge and understanding. If it is not working well, something is wrong. As philosopher Amartya Sen said, if a nation's press is unhealthy, so is its government. That's why if you look at the situation today, there is cause for concern. In particular, the increased threat of litigation against news organizations 
is threatening our constitutional order and government. In the 1964 Supreme Court case, previously mentioned New York Times v. Sullivan, which heightened the standard to bring a successful defamation case by a public official. Um, for decades following that case, reporters in the US have felt a certain freedom that they can publish truthful information and be protected as long as they didn't report with malice. To prove actual malice under Sullivan, a plaintiff has to show that the writer knew that the disputed statement was false or had acted with, quote, reckless disregard. That standard in Sullivan, a watershed case changing the news media into the robust institution that helped expose Watergate, Guantanamo, Snowden, and countless other stories. For 55 years, that lofty precedent that helped journalists of legend like Woodward and Bernstein, as well as freelancers in the news industry, feel confident when reporting on matters of government accountability without the fear of retribution through a vexatious libel suit. Indeed, before Sullivan, a number of defamation lawsuits against news organizations around the country was nearly $300 million as part of a focused effort by Southern officials to use libel suits as a means of preventing critical coverage of civil rights issues. After Sullivan, the number precipitously dropped. However, today, it appears that things may be reversing course and we may be returning to a pre-Sullivan era. Nearly a decade ago, the number of libel lawsuits against the news media institutions was meager and usually only brought by plaintiffs who were not represented by counsel and therefore didn't know how unlikely they were to win. For example, New York Times counsel David McCraw wrote that between 2010 and 2017, the Times had 11 libel suits, all but one of them filed in the United States. This is meaningfully different from today when the Times has several libel lawsuits on its docket. As McCraw writes, Sullivan led to a series of other court decisions that curtailed the ability of libel plaintiffs to win their lawsuits. None of it was intended to be balancing. It was an imbalancing, a conscious decision by the courts to free journalists to pursue the truth without fear of triggering a lawsuit that could bankrupt their publisher. The Sullivan decision, like the First Amendment itself, was anchored in the belief that competing voices rather than lawsuits, were the best way to get at truth. So what happened from the time of Sullivan until now? In 2012, the news media, legally speaking, hit a huge inflection point. Many of you will well remember the tale of Balea v. Gawker. As you likely recall, in that case, Peter Thiel, a wealthy Silicon Valley billionaire, funded a costly litigation brought by Hulk Hogan, or Terry Balea, as a vendetta against the news outlet for doxing him. The lawsuit ultimately put the newsroom out of business by forcing it into bankruptcy. In essence, Gawker couldn't afford to defend itself against the lawsuit, even where the alleged claims had no legs. As fewer people might know, the federal district court that remanded the case back down to the state court repeatedly said, Plaintiff had no tenable legal argument under privacy or libel, noting protections under the First Amendment and H Hogan's public persona. In fact, as any media attorney would have told you, if Gawker had had its full date in court and was able to appeal, it would have won. Unfortunately, Gawker folded because it couldn't fit foot the bill of litigation. While the law of the First Amendment and New York Times v. Sullivan is still good law, as explained by the federal district judge, what various wealthy and elite took away from Gawker was not the state of the law, but that the judicial system could be used to wear down a news institution through expensive litigation. Since that case, many other wealthy members in our society have followed this blueprint, bringing frivolous but costly defamation lawsuits against the Times, BuzzFeed, Washington Post, Mother Jones, the Center for Investigative Reporting, just to name a few. After Gawker, Brian Knappenberger made a documentary, Nobody Speaks, noticing this pattern. Knappenberger noticed, quote, an ugly theme of billionaires involved in media bringing lawsuits or tearing down the, th the press. Working for a newsroom that's facing one of these battles, I can concretely state that the price of litigation is no small feat and deeply concerning. 
As the news industry is facing unprecedented shifts in our business model, having lost advertising as the main source of income, defending such suits is a Goliath task. Even with insurance, the costs can be insurmountable. In part, these costs are due to the massive technological changes in society that have expanded a journalist's footprint to the size of Bigfoot's big ugly cousin. Years ago, in a defamation lawsuit brought against a newspaper, there would be a limited amount of information, a handful of notepads, documents, tape recordings. But today, we have discovery that can surface millions of records from emails, apps, chats, digital tape recordings, tweets, Facebook messages, troves of leaked documents. For instance, in CIR's own libel lawsuit, which involved one episode of our podcast called Reveal, reporters went out into the field in the early morning, would turn on the digital tape recorder, and wouldn't shut it off until the rest of the day. This is normal course today. They did this for days. So discovery required us to listen to hours of tapes to accurately respond to discovery requests. That doesn't even begin to account for a fraction of the records involved in litigation, including the leaked records, emails, chats, Google Calendar invitations, and all else. To go through this type of discovery, you have to have a bank account that's not just plump, but overflowing. We at CIR, a nonprofit investigative newsroom with a budget of 11 million, were not looking good. In fact, until this past fall, I, my CEO, and outside counsel were seriously concerned about the future of our newsroom. Luckily, we were able to secure pro bono counsel offered from Covington and Davis Wright Tremaine, without which future of CIR, the oldest nonprofit newsroom in the country, would have been more than uncertain. It would have been deadly. And with that end, would not only have gone 40 years of legacy of investigative reporting, but countless stories about people, injustices, and tales about Americans. But other newsrooms are not as lucky. Just this past year, lawyers for Covington Catholic High School student filed a $275 million defamation suit against CNN. The Washington Post was sued by the same family for $250 million. David Nunez, we heard, sued for a $150 million defamation suit. But luckily, Sullivan is still good law. Many cases still get thrown out for not meeting the Sullivan standard. Recently, the Victoria Advocate, a local new Texas newspaper, won a case brought by a doctor asking for $2 million in damages. That said, in just this past year, we've seen another huge worry arise. This time is not just the cost of litigation, but the legal underpinnings itself, i.e. Sullivan. In the past few years, there have been concerns over the future of that lofty precedent is falling. As many of you know, in 2016, the president was quoted for saying, quote, I can't do the accent, so apologies. I'm going to open up our libel laws so when they write purposely negative and horrible false articles, we can sue them and win lots of money. While media attorneys quickly scoffed at these seemingly absurd statements, more recently, a U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clam Clarence Thomas wrote something alarmingly similar in an opinion, saying, New York Times v. Sullen was, quote, policy-driven decision masquerading as constitutional law. He continued, there appears to be little historical evidence suggesting that the New York Times actual malice standard flows from the original understanding of the First and Fourteenth Amendment. So... <laughs> Now that I've scared you and laid out this problem, what is there left to say? Well, despite all that, believe it or not, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because of the doctrine of stare decisis states that Sullivan, a half century old case, is not only good law, but deeply entrenched in our history. As law professor Sonia West wrote in a 2018 article, Historical evidence from the founding era shows that the framers considered press freedom to be of vital importance. James Madison declared that liberty of the press to be one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and essential to security of freedom in a state. Adams also said that a free press maintains the majesty of a people. Working in a newsroom, you certainly see this. Things have not changed. Journalists continue to be vital, deeply resilient, and majestic. But other than resilience, there are several things reporters can do to beat the bullies. And it goes back to grade school. Do your homework. 
Journalists today must spell out everything in a story. For instance, Kept Out, a recent Pulitzer finalist story written by our journalists at CIR, which revealed that home loans given by banks across the country were racially disparate, was helped by us providing more detail than common. Based on a regression analysis done by our data team, our newsroom issued a white paper that delved into the specific mathematical equations that led to our shocking findings. This made all the purported claims by the banks that our findings were wrong very easy to combat because we did our homework. Additionally, it's essential that journalists keep a healthy note-taking hygiene. As I've explained to reporters in my newsroom, when documents are no longer limited to a few notebooks and a cardboard box in a newsroom, journalists are increasingly vulnerable. Today, reporters must be cognizant that everything they create on their smartphone can be searched and collected. And where records can't be taken from a newsroom, they can be subpoenaed from a third party provider like Facebook, Google, or Twitter. So journalists should therefore keep a catalog of all the records they are creating for a story on various platforms. Reporters for Reveal are starting to do this now for all major news investigations. Dovetailing from there, don't use fighting words on the playground. While platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are helpful to journalists, they encourage guttural responses and quick-witted remarks with likes. But do not fall prey. These likable thoughts on Twitter can easily become the subject of a lawsuit that will come back to haunt you. Ask Rolling Stone. Okay. <laughs> Outside of that, what can attorneys do? Outside of reporters, what can attorneys do? First, they have to support media organizations like the Reporters Committee and the Knight Institute. Law firms should support pro bono work. Attorneys should promote anti-slap legislation. And most of all, in-house counsel should never settle. As David McCraw wrote in a famous letter now, if Trump disagrees, we welcome the opportunity to have a court set him straight which might be my last point. <laughs> Never settle. Settling creates a bad precedent. And, oh God, I'm just gonna cut to the, <laughs> we're almost done. Um, settling creates a bad precedent and uh, it basically instigates people to continue suing. I'll end with just one short note of hope. As history shows us, our country has survived similar instances of threat. In the 1790s, John Adams wrote, as was written about John Adams, in an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and self-avarice, he put over 30 journalists in jail. But even then, journalists were resilient. In fact, one put in jail named Matthew Lyon ran for Congress and won. I suggest we do the same.